3. To the castle of the Yusuf born. The path of flight, smuggler's route, Jalalabad to Pakistan, June 9th to 19th. Next morning, when the three travellers set off at dawn on horseback, Fazli Rabbi relaxed his medieval and Pashtun manner to disclose that he had been planning to visit the Yusuf Zai leader for some time, and also that, in spite of his apparent indifference to affairs other than those of the Sarai, he had detailed knowledge of what was going on in the country. There is a very large Russian military force quite near here, he said. Their headquarters is at Jalalabad city, and they come from the 201st Soviet Motorized Rifle Division. They support what is left of the 11th Afghan Infantry, most of whose men have deserted to the Mujahideen. Recently, the Nikolais called in helicopters to pursue some guerrillas into Pakistani territory over there. He waved his hand in the direction of the frontier, and the Pakistanis shot two of them down. Now the Rus are quieter. They used Hind helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft. That reminds me, don't pick anything up from the ground. The Rus drop explosive grenades designed to maim, made dogs defile their graves. Fazli Rabi's interest and his very detailed facts, even the numbers of the divisions and the data on the aircraft, made Maryam realize that this was no ordinary Pashtun or even innkeeper. Hind, for example, was the code name used by NATO to denote the MI-24. They were called that in Western shortwave news broadcasts. Inayat also had a sharp eye for weaponry, and she once said, Sam 7s are the medicine for those, as a Russian helicopter passed overhead. Even Miriam only dimly remembered from the radio that the Sam 7 was a shoulder launched rocket. They are heat seekers, you know, continued Inayat, with a device for locking onto the exhaust of a hostile aircraft. They are useful against tanks, too. On the other hand, she worried more than her husband did about the boys left to look after the Sarai. You know, she said to Miriam as they rode side by side into the hills, Fazli Rabbi insisted on calling them Azil and Palang. That means noble and leopard. He is fond of leopards and thinks that they are noble. But are these the right names for people who will run a business? Many people believe that people try to follow the meaning of their name. What do you think? I am sure they'll manage all right, was all that the girl from Kabul could think of, so she said it. Well, said Iniat, I suppose they will be all right. After all, Zabadast, my husband's surname, means violent or powerful, and yet he has made a very good thing of the Sarai since we took it over ten years ago. Before that, he was in the army, you know. North of subtropical Jalalabad, with, for mountainous Afghanistan, the amazing sight of palm trees and citrus fruits growing, the road follows the Kunar River, the ancient Koaspis flowing down from the snow-capped mountains of Kafiristan, land of the infidel. Fazli Rabbi led his party northwards at first, following the route probably taken by Alexander the Great on his Indian campaign through smiling fields, past ancient Buddhist monuments, into walled towns with medieval forts to guard them, this was, at last, the real land of the Pashtuns. Everywhere they went, herdsmen with flocks of fat-tailed sheep, farmers opening their irrigation channels for the day's watering, children hurrying to the mullah's school, called out the inevitable, Stare Marche, may you not be tired. Those with more time to spend would invite the travellers into a tea house or a walled garden where soft fruits, peaches, apricots, plums grew. Are you strong? Are you happy? May faith be thy daily bread. Every man carried a gun, some of them the long muzzle-loading jazails, handmade perhaps a century or more ago, 
others perfect replicas of British Lee-Enfield 303s made in the transborder armories of the Afridis. They were perfect copies, even to the stamp GVI, King George VI. The empire, which owned more than a quarter of the surface of the earth, had struggled, ineffectively, to add this territory to it when the Pashtuns had declined the honour. As Miriam and her escort moved deeper and deeper into tribal territory, there were Kalashnikovs, rockets and the new Soviet grenades. When he can, the Pashtun warrior tries to keep up with developments in weapons technology. Once, Miriam saw, silhouetted against the evening sky, a huge clansman on a horse, his grenade launcher on his back, scanning the darkening sky for helicopters. Behind him, on a donkey, like the squire of some knight of long ago, came his disciple, a boy of perhaps ten, carrying a backpack of the latest Russian rockets, ready to hand them to his master the moment there was action. The international border, the Durand Line, had been drawn through the middle of the tribal lands. On one side was Pakistan, inheritor of the British Raj, on the other Afghanistan, master, until so recently, of its own destiny. As the party moved further northwards, the going became harder, the trail passing north and east through stark mountains, where beetle-browed warriors of the Tarklanris saluted them gravely with an upraised hand, then went back to their ploughing, rifles slung across their backs, more often than not with a red rose stuck in the long ringlets behind their ears. On the whole, the Pashtuns were magnificent specimens, which some attributed to the fact that infant mortality was very high and only the toughest survived. They were darker than the average Afghans, usually tall, with hooked noses and long, often straight black hair and eyes which varied from grey to deepest black. Again and again, as if from nowhere, sentries would appear and seek the traveller's credentials, usually by a brief exchange of words. Peace on thee, and on thee peace. Where from and where to? from Jalalabad to the Yusuf land. With faith in God, may thou become great. I entrust you to God, may thou be blessed. Without the deep valleys cut into the mountains by the rivers flowing here for uncounted millennia, it would have been impossible to get through these mountains. Fazli Rabbi and the two women crossed the international border without knowing it. Both the Afghans and the Pakistanis, following tradition, left the tribal people to their own devices. If they had tried to put up fences or barbed wire, they would have been torn down. This was the Rahi Gorez, the path of flight, used by refugees and smugglers moving between the Indian subcontinent and Central Asia. They stopped, the first night, at the fort of Malik Miskin Khan, a friend of the innkeeper from Jalalabad. He was all of six foot seven inches high, an ancient warrior chief who commanded nine thousand fighting men. He was allied by blood to the Yusufzai innkeeper, and he proudly showed off his family tree, mounted on the wall of his bare reception hall in the clay brick fort. It traced his family back to the great Kez of the Bani Israel. Lady, he said to Miriam, we Pashtuns have three parts to the code of the Pashtun, called Pashtunwali. They are hospitality, safe conduct, and exchange. The last means that we exact a life for a life, insist on requital for misdeeds. But... He drew himself up and gulped some green tea from a china cup. In practice, ancestry is the most important thing for the Bani Israel. It is so important that it is not mentioned in Pashtunwali, in fact. It is taken for granted. The following morning, when they were about to leave, Miriam made the mistake of offering to pay for the night's hospitality. The old chief at first bristled, 
looked as if he was going to do something violent, then laughed. It pleases the Pashtun to know that he can outdo others in hospitality, he said, and so I am glad that I can teach you something. He illustrated this double-edged compliment with a tale, which he insisted on telling, even though it meant delaying the start of the day's march. You will know, he began, that there is now in Kabul the presence of the Rus, the eaters of filth. Not long ago, a Pashtun notable of the Musakhel, the Moses tribe, who hailed from far south of here towards Baluchistan, was turned out of his house. His name was Ibrahim Khan, and his house was wanted by the Rus for the family of one of their officials. As you also probably know, he made a gesture of contempt, Kabul people do not help their neighbors, and they have little or no clan feeling. So Ibrahim had nobody to support him against the tyrants, and thus he became, in his old age, destitute. He had to sell shish kebabs in the street. The ancient stroked his beard. Among us, even though we are warriors, commerce has no stigma. In fact, it is a blessing for all the prophets engaged in trade of one sort or another. He paused for a long time, and then looked at the travellers, as if seeking encouragement. What did Ibrahim Khan do? asked Miriam, genuinely interested. Ah, what could he do? He sold kebabs, and he waited. Then one day someone shot the Russian who had taken his house. Perhaps it was Ibrahim Khan, perhaps word had got back to his people, who sent someone for Badal, exchange. So he got his house back? Miriam asked. Patience, child, that is not the point. My intention is to tell you about nobility of spirit, about honour and taking things from women. The old man made everyone sit down and called for tea. Then he resumed. Although the Russian was dead, his wife still lived in the house. Ibrahim could not touch her, for it is sham, a dishonorable thing to harm a woman. He waited for a chance to show his Pashtun Wali, his chivalry. It so happened, said the old man, gazing into the blue haze of the mountainside where the track which Miriam would ascend ran far into the distance that one day the wife of the Russian came upon Ibrahim Khan selling kebabs in the street. She said, Are you not the man who once owned the house in which I live? He answered her, I am Ibrahim Khan of the Musa Kel, and my dwelling is the one known as Flower Fountain. She said, Yes, that is the house. Can you help me? He said, what help do you need, woman of democracy, from a kebab seller in the Kabul streets? Your people say that they rule this land, and they should help you if you seek it. Are you not Nufustar, one who has people? Your people say that they rule this land, and they should help you if you seek it. She said, Yes, I have people, but I cannot trust them. My husband is dead, and I have no money. I shall soon be sent back to Russia, and there I shall be poor. But I have heard that there are jewels buried somewhere in the flower fountain garden. Do you know this legend from long ago? Can you help me find them? If you do, I shall reward you. The elder of the Musa Kel said, Let it not be said that someone asked Ibrahim Khan for help in vain. I shall come with you, lady. To summarize, he went to the house and took up a spade. Then he asked himself, Where would I hide jewels in this garden if I had any? His instinct answered him. He began to dig, and presently he unearthed a large clay pot filled with wonderful gold and jeweled ornaments which had been buried there at the time of the second British invasion. He gave the treasure to the Russian woman. She said, Ibrahim Khan, you and I are now rich. Take as much of the treasure as you wish, and my thanks with it. And Ibrahim Khan told her, 
I am Ibrahim, son of a chief and a man of the Musa born. I answer the cry of distress of a woman, and I help her. Shall it ever be said of me that I have profited from the misery of a woman? The old man gave the travellers one by one a penetrating look. And my answer to you, Maryam Jeanne, is just the same. Well said, son of Kez, shouted Zabadast. And I, on our journey, shall see that the lady knows the tale about the man, his guest, and his horse, for she may not have heard it yet. With faith in God, I entrust you to God. They went on their way again. The northward journey from Jalalabad to the stronghold of the Yusufzai chieftain was no more than a hundred and twenty miles as the crow flies. Across these mountains, however, and through these deep valleys, at times almost as desolate as a moonscape, it was half as far again. The little party forded rivers, their horses splashing gratefully through the crystal waters, while the June sun beat down upon them and the dust-laden singing wind sprang up, viciously scouring their faces and hands, then dying, suddenly, into an eerie silence. Maryam found, in Fazli Rabbi and his wife, an infinite source of folklore, general information, songs and stories, and contemporary knowledge. As they rode, Maryam adapted slowly to the outdoor life of the Afghan borderland, and they talked continually about everything under the sun. She soon saw that this was no country bumpkin and his woman, wayside innkeepers interested only in gossip and profit. Nor were the pair merely relating things that they had heard. They knew a great deal, in depth, and Maryam was soon sure that Fazli Rabbi and Inayat were deeply involved in the freedom struggle. It is obvious, the Pashtun said when they were sheltering from the midday sun on the fourth day in the wilds, that you are an Afghan. But you are a Shari, a city dweller, and somewhat soft. This journey will correct that. You are already riding your horse like a veteran, not like someone out for exercise because she has eaten too much pilau the night before. She was getting used to the Pashtun raillery, the half aggressive, half humorous way in which these people treated one another. Fazli Rabbi was including her in his community by speaking like that. It was, she supposed, something of a compliment. Did he know how the border people felt about the puppet government? There had been rumours that the tribal chiefs were being bribed by the Karmal regime to keep quiet, to let Kabul rule the settled parts of Afghanistan. Maryam felt well enough established with her host to sound him out. The huge Pashtun's face cracked into a smile. The tribes, collectively, are both part of Afghanistan and not part of it. Part of it because most of the people in the country are Pashtuns. Not part of it because we were here before there was an Afghanistan, and millions of us live outside, in the free land, between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Millions more live in what is now known as Pakistan. When you meet more of us, as we get deeper into our free territory, you'll see other differences. He gave a huge, bellowing laugh, which so alarmed his horse that it whinnied. You see, we don't like being administered. He spoke the word with a scowl that would have wiped the smile off the face of a plaster saint. Pashtuns being administered was obviously a very serious matter. The British came here, as you know, armed to the teeth. They drew a line on a map and had a conference with the Kabul government. The parties agreed, he lapsed into direct speech, this is ours and this is yours. Fazli Rabbi stared at Maryam's eyes and bared his teeth. They said, on this side is Afghanistan and this side India. They made one serious mistake. And what was that mistake, Maryam Jeanne? 
Merriam said. They cut the Pashtun land in two. Yes, Merriam, they did, but only on the map. He looked at her triumphantly. You see, neither the Afghans nor the British actually ruled the area. Perhaps this is the first time in history that people, probably through vanity, took into their territory a nation whom they did not, could not, administer. How could that happen? Merriam asked. Very easily. The Afghans of Kabul were afraid to say that they could not rule the tribes. The British were the same. Sir Mortimer Durand was their man. The two got together and could not admit to one another that neither of them could rule the clans. So they drew a map, drew a map, and the line was called, still is, the Durand Line. Fazli Rabbi laughed and shook his head. Drew a map. Mariam Jean, that was about ninety years ago. The Pashtun tribesmen had already descended into India in search of loot. Their own land was often poor, mountain ranges and near desert. You know the saying about why India was there? He pointed his finger at Mariam. Yes, Fazli Rabbi, we've even heard it in Kabul. It runs, if Allah had not intended the Pashtuns to have fat moneylenders to rob, why would he, in his wisdom, have placed them so near at hand in India? Well said, girl. But there is more to it than that. The Pashtuns always used to enter the service of any conqueror, including their own leaders. You have heard of the Pashtun kings of Delhi, our own Raj, haven't you? Yes, of course. Well, more recently, the British were afraid that the Russians would foment the wildness of the tribes and persuade them to descend on the British domain in India and the Kabul Afghans feared that the Pashtuns would attack them. In fact, of course, the Pashtuns have always fought to preserve Afghanistan. So long as they were on the southern and eastern flank, Kabul was safe against invasion. But, said Merriam, the Kabul rulers have always had to keep the tribes sweet. That is the talk of Kabul. People are always complaining that they send food, clothing, money and arms to the Pashtuns. Certainly, and the British did exactly the same. The Pakistanis do it too, but remember, we do not call this bribery. It is tribute from weaker peoples. Fazli Rabbi gave another huge laugh. Mariam had heard some of this before. The names of the warrior clans and of their ruling families were as well known and as feared or respected in Asia as any elite elsewhere. Their war cries, usually the clan's surname, echoed through the hills. Afridi, Waziri, Oragzai, Katak, Masud, Shinwari, and a dozen more. It is natural, Fazli Rabbi was saying that when Babrak Kamal was brought from the communist lands into Afghanistan as a Russian puppet, he should be mortally afraid of us, the ten million Pashtuns. Kamal continued sending the customary presents, money, trucks, radios, food. The money from Kabul was known as the Watch and Ward Allowance and was paid out of the policing budget of the Ministry of Tribes. Merriam said, Did Karmal's money pacify the tribes or reconcile them to the communist regime? At first, I do admit, Fazli Rabbi scratched his head, we kept out of Kabul affairs, as we always do. But when murder without reason, atrocities, acts beyond anything sanctioned by law and custom, carried out by Russian miscreants, became widespread, we thought again. We gave sanctuary to the refugees and allowed them to go down into Pakistan. We welcomed their fighting men and their army deserters when they started to come to us and to form guerrilla bands. But, my girl, Pasli Rabbi shot a glance to Mariam to make sure that she was absorbing the lesson. Many Pashtuns are vain, like so many other people. 
Carmel knew this, and at first doubled his bounty and sent men to explain that the refugees were malcontents, the deserters criminals. I myself saw the beautiful air-conditioned buses, loaded with gifts, which came to the jirgas, the assemblies of the people presided over by the chiefs. But it was not enough. Miriam could see the picture, the greybeards taking the presents but increasingly objecting to the regime. It was not enough. Carmel then invited a selection of chiefs and greybeards to Kabul for a conference. He proposed to explain to them how he and the new order in Afghanistan was to save the country and its people from Zionism and the Chinese, from America and Britain, from Pakistan and India. Practically the whole world, it seemed from his message, was about to descend upon the Afghans. Well, the Maliks, which means kings, you know, our leaders are as important as that, either went in person or sent influential representatives. They were regaled with huge feasts, taken to see the wonders of the great city, filmed for television. A select number of Pashtun leaders were accommodated in the Kabul Intercontinental Hotel, with its soft beds, marble floors, chandeliers and coffee bars. I was there myself, and I noticed that this tourist paradise impressed some of them less when they saw, mounted on the walls, muzzle-loading muskets of the kind which their clansmen had stopped using fifty years and more ago. Telling them that these were there just for decoration only made them laugh. Eventually the delegates were settled in the large conference hall, film cameras whirring, to hear the harangues of the new men of the party, explaining why it was best that Afghanistan should embrace socialism. The immense portraits of the man known locally as Call Morks had been removed. He was too obviously a foreigner. After a few warming-up speeches, recited from texts prepared by the Ministry of Information by officials who seemed, to the huge fighting men, to be of suspiciously paltry physique, there was a stir of interest. Members of two or three Pashtun clans got up and spoke, fervently and at length, on the good things of the Carmel regime. In accordance with custom, none of those listening showed any reaction, but they were certainly memorizing faces. Decisions, of course, are not made at assemblies like this. Much consultation had to take place between the elders and the ordinary members of the tribe. As a final touch, Babrak Karmal, surrounded by armed security men, stepped onto the platform. He was short, even in his platform shoes, plump and shifty-eyed. He seemed reluctant to look directly at any of the 250 men sitting there, silent and appraising. He probably felt a bit like a Christian in a Roman arena, unsure if and when the lions were going to spring. Journalists present have said that they actually felt the hair rising on the back of their necks as these warriors and elders looked at the man who was claiming to be their leader. They knew that both his puppet predecessors had been assassinated, and in the past two years at that. Comrade Karmal had given a good deal of thought to his speech. He regarded these men as politically immature. They would not respond to the kind of phrases which he was accustomed to using. He had been trained in Eastern Europe and knew that many people there, as in the West, responded to meaningless clichés which had somehow acquired magical force in their ears anyway. How did you know that? Miriam felt compelled to ask. Fazli Rabbi fascinated her. I have seen a copy of the speech in draft form sent from Moscow, and I remember the text, remember it very well. We are, on the whole, a verbal and not a literate people. That means we have very retentive memories. 
Well, Mariam Jean, that kind of talk would only be likely to raise the consciousness of the ten million tribesmen to the fact that the time was nearly ripe to kill him as one of the Malahida, the atheist infidels. His speech, in contrast to the gibberish he regularly gave to the tame party men, or the patronizing sneers he bestowed on the unconverted, was a model of courtesy and tact. Afghanistan was threatened by terrible enemies, as in the past. She was independent, Muslim, hopeful of progress. She had a future as great as her glorious past, a past which was largely due to the ancestors of the Pashtun warlords assembled here. Give me your help against the Zionist imperialists and I shall give you everything, he concluded, and his assembled platform clack cried their customary hoorah. The hoorah was just a little subdued, for their eyes were fixed not on the leader, but on the unblinking lion gaze of the frontier men. Malik Asaf, one of the most important of the tribal overlords, stood up first, as was his due. All eyes turned to him, and Carmel bowed, wondering whether this man would support or reject him. Everything depended on the next few moments. There is one question to ask, he said. He was over seventy years of age, six feet four in height, with a hooked nose and a large white turban, crossed bandoliers on his chest, and a voice like the sound of boulders rumbling down the mountainside. Please ask it, Shaghali Malik Asaf Khan, Kamal managed to smile. Mr. Karmal, as you know, I represent my people. If they want to know something, I must see that it is asked. It does not have to represent my own views. Of course, respected Malik. In that case, as this is a fraternal meeting, as you have said, I request that it be put by the man who asked it. He is here, beside me. Please continue. It must be some important associate of the Malik, Kamal thought. This might be a good sign. Perhaps the Malik was bringing in a friend with influence to prepare the ground or to test the water. In the deliberations of the Pashtun and Afghan people, roared the Malik in what he thought was a soft voice, all, even the lowest, have the right to speak. It must be the same, of course, in your democracy. So with pleasure I call upon Yusuf, son of Suleiman, who helps in the kitchens of my fort. The silence seemed to become even deeper. Kamal squirmed, his face wet, both from the heat of the television lights and from anxiety. The Malik had trapped him. He had given permission for the voice of democracy, to deny it now would not only be against Pashtun Wali, it would be an insult to the Malik. Even to scorn, publicly, a pot scrubber, who was also a member of the Malik's tribe, could start a war. He stood for a moment, then sat down, hard, on the plastic chair behind him on the platform. Yusuf, son of Suleiman, stood up as if this was his own house. Pashtuns are hardly ever shy. Mr. Kamal, I want to know when the Russian army, sons of noseless mothers, will leave Afghanistan. Kamal recovered quickly and reached for the stock answer prepared for him in Moscow. He had repeated it so often that it now sounded quite plausible. The limited contingent of the Red Army will leave Afghanistan when foreign intervention has stopped and when our borders are secure. He looked around and resumed the oily smile which had become a reflex. The chiefs were slumped in their upright plastic chairs, many of them with eyes half-closed. Most were accustomed to sitting cross-legged, and Kamal had in any case ordered too much food for them in the middle of the day. Nobody paid much attention to the youth who stood up again, a young Pashtun of no important rank. Yusuf waited for Karmal to sit down before he spoke. Your answer reminds me of a tale told among the Pashtun people. 
Mr. Call Morks might care to hear it too. Perhaps you could repeat it to him sometime. This is the tale. There was once a fisherman who caught such a huge and wonderful fish that he thought he must take it to the king. When he was given an audience carrying his fish, the people of the court were amazed. They knew that the king would have to give, in exchange, a really wonderful present to equal such a gift. As you know, Mr. Carmel, a king must always return a gift with something of similar value. The king was delighted but perplexed, because he was covetous and stingy and a puppet of his vizier, the prime minister. The vizier, as always, was standing behind the king to counsel him in whispers, and the king leant back somewhat to hear what the advice would be. The vizier, whose thoughts were always quick, told the king to ask whether this fish was a male or a female. This the king did. Everyone was absorbed in the story now. The eastern habit of using parables to make a point was something they almost lived by. Many of them knew the tale, but they wanted to deduce what meaning the kitchen boy was suggesting for it. But, continued the youth, though without power, the fisherman was intelligent. He reasoned that the king and the vizier were trying to fob him off. Whether he said it was a male or a female, the king would tell him to go away and catch its mate, which would be impossible, because there never was another such fish. Thus he thought the court would save themselves the reward, and he would lose face when he failed. By this trick the king and the vizier would appear wise to the courtiers. So he answered, Majesty, this fish is neither, it is Narmada a hermaphrodite. There was a roar of applause from the assembled chiefs, and Karmal, nonplussed, declared the meeting closed. That evening, everyone in Kabul knew the story. Before curfew time, the Shabnamas, night papers, passed from hand to hand and printed by the resistance, said, Karmal is a puppet king, and his red Afghanistan is a hermaphrodite. Pass it on. Signed the Fisherman. There have been no more meetings of Pashtun clan chiefs in Kabul since that day. This may have been because of the hostility which Pashtuns always feel towards the hirelings of foreign powers. It may have been due to the story of the hermaphrodite fish, told by the kitchen boy from the borderland. Or it may, indeed, have been because those chiefs suspected of sympathy with Karmal were found dead, shot or stabbed in their homes within weeks of that conference. So, Miriam, Fasli Rabbi concluded, you will now better understand the kind of people in whose land we are and whose chiefs we are about to meet. These tales are recited from village to village by the travelling bards. They call them Tidings of the Folk. It was ten days before Merriam saw, against the deep blue sky, through the heat haze, the imposing outline of the Pashtun castle which was their goal. It was battlemented and built of the same kind of boulders which littered the terrain, cemented together. Its walls, all of twenty feet thick, were patterned with loopholes. Parts of the walls had been chipped by the heavy artillery shells used against it in one or other of the campaigns, against the men of the free land. It had never been conquered, even when 40,000 British troops had been thrown into battle against a single clan, the Yusuf Zais, a century ago. Three massively built Pashtun warriors, their hair in ringlets and turbans worn askew, with that air of insolence which appeals to some and infuriates others, came striding down the road which led to the main keep. Peace. Peace. I am Fazli Rabbi, nephew. May God give you salvation. You are one of our own. Is there permission to enter? Honor us. The great wooden doors swung open, and a group of men who had been sitting around in the courtyard beyond rose to their feet, 
and formed a double row in honour of the visitors. A tall, thin man with bushy beard and long robe came out from the cool darkness of the inner colonnades and embraced Fazli Rabbi Khan amid the ritual shouting and noisy exchange of compliments which makes so many strangers think that Pashtuns, when they meet, are about to start a fight. He was about thirty, Merriam guessed. His clothes were costly, the robe of brocade, with gold-embroidered slippers on his feet. Maryam Jan, this is Daud Khan, son of the chief of the Yusuf Zai, our host, the Lion of the Frontier. The Lion turned to her and smiled, showing perfect white teeth. Parke Ragli, you come with happiness. Transport your honourable self in this direction. He spoke courtly Pashtu of an archaic kind, and used the language gracefully. They went into a long high divan reception hall inside the castle, carpeted with precious rugs, hung with valuable ancient Bokharan tapestries. Seated on bolsters before mounds of spiced rice and chicken, Dowd explained that his father was away, but that he was anxious to be of any possible help to his new guests. He had business with Fazli Rabbi too, Crate upon crate of shiny new machine guns littered the hall, their tops open, the stenciling which might have shown their origin covered with daubs of black paint. Dowd gestured towards them. As you can see, my Khan, we are ready to speak with you. Merriam offered to leave the two men alone to discuss business, but Dowd said, Merriam Jean, the British in their time used to drop leaflets over here, saying that they had an empire with six hundred million people in it. I gather that the Russians only have two hundred million or so. Goyim Baka Piran, filth upon the infidels. We shall manage them, so we don't waste time here with what some call security. That was that. Maryam gathered that Daud Khan was some kind of agent for a Pashtun called Paindagul, Everlasting Flower, who had consigned the arms to him. Fazli Rabbi was to arrange their transfer to guerrillas operating in the Kunar Valley area, and Daud would pay for transport. She was intrigued to learn that this Paindagul from England was spending his entire fortune, earned during a lifetime in commerce, on weapons for the guerrillas. The two men included her in their conversation. They took Payne de Gaulle's contribution so much for granted that she found herself saying, But isn't this a rather extravagant gesture? What is he going to live on after this? They both laughed. Then Fazli Rabbi said, Daujan, I promised the old man, Miskin Khan, at Aluka, that I would let Merriam hear the famous tale of the Pashtun and his horse. So far, I haven't told it to her. Perhaps you'd like to do so, then she'd understand what our people are really like. Certainly, said Daud. He made a sign to the various fighters, courtiers, and others in the hall to gather round. All of them, including servants, formed a ring on the floor. When water pipes had been brought, he began. There was once, among the Suleiman people, a tribesman who always adhered to the principles of hospitality and honour, to Pashtun Wali. He owned a beautiful horse of high pedigree, worth a great deal of money. But he fell upon evil days and lost all his money. He still refused to sell his horse, which he managed to feed and keep fit, the last vestige of his opulent past. A man who had long coveted this animal decided that the time was ripe to try to buy it from this man, Ishmael Khan, and he went to his house to open negotiations. When Ishmael Khan saw him coming, he arranged for his wife to prepare a meal for the guest. The other man arrived at the door, and as is the usual way among us, the two of them talked for a long time about generalities, and then they ate. When the meal was over, the would-be buyer asked Ismail Khan whether it would be possible to buy his horse and that he would give him a huge price for it. 
My friend, said Ishmael, you are too late. That stew which you just ate was made from the flesh of that very same horse. You see, he had nothing else to give his guest. Daud Khan pointed his finger at Miriam. Sister, when there is a guest or when someone needs help, the Pashtun will make any sacrifice. What I have just told you is a legend, but what you have heard about Paindagul is a fact. Do you think he cares what happens to him financially as a consequence of his sacrifice? The following morning, Miriam descended from her cool room, lined with cedar wood, in the upper floor of the castle, to find a bulky figure, a man of fifty or more years of age, poking about in the packing cases which were still strewn about the main hall. Peace, he said. Peace. I am Paindagul. I arrived late last night. May thou never find adversity. Life was getting more and more like a fairy tale. An hour or two later, a fusillade of shots rang out. Miriam ran to the window of the sitting room where she was resting to see two men entering the castle grounds. They were Mujahideen, wearing Afghan shirts and baggy trousers, crossed bandoliers and rough wool hats. The Yusuf Zais embraced them like long-lost brothers. The shots which she had heard were in welcome, not hostility. David Khalil and Bardol, from the Eagle's Nest, had arrived to arrange the smuggling of their share of the weapons. Welcome. Are the men strong? Strong. The Almighty be with thee. Prosper. Be blessed. <laughs> 